Welcome to another Daniel Revelation Talks. I'm Cody Morey here with Pastor Bill Hughes. And we are continuing our study in Revelation chapter 14. Uh, we've, we're got, we've gotten right up to the first start, verse 6, to the start of the first angel's message. But there remained a little bit of confusion and discussion uh, that we will go over for the great multitude and the 144,000. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that you would be here with us, yes. that you would abide here in this place with us, that you would send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds yes. and help us to understand what you are saying in the scriptures and what you are saying in the spirit of prophecy, to compare them together to just bring forth your pure, simple truth. That's what we ask for mm -hmm. today as we study. Help us to understand the first angel's message. Help us to understand the great multitude and the 144,000 as you would have us yes. to understand them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, Pastor Hughes, one of the issues that came up was whether or not the 144,000 was a literal number or a spiritual number. And it's very clear from the spirit of prophecy that it is a literal number. And I actually have a couple quotes here um, from the spirit of prophecy on this issue. So this was one of the confusion points that we had. And we've actually brought this up in a previous talk. I believe you read the quote itself in a previous talk back when we were doing uh, Revelation chapter 7, I believe. Mm. But uh, if you go to Maranatha, page 287, or if it's easier for you to October 6th, because it's a devotional, mm -hmm. it says, The voice of God is heard from heaven declaring the day and hour of Jesus' coming and delivering everlasting covenant to his people. Like peals of loudest thunder, his words roll through the earth. He spoke one sentence and then paused while the words were rolling through the earth. The Israel of God stood with their eyes fixed upward, listening to the words as they came from the mouth of Jehovah and rolled through the earth like peals of loudest thunder. It was awfully solemn. At the end of every sentence, the saints shouted, Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> the living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. The Israel of God stand listening with their eyes fixed upward. Their countenances are lighted with, up with his glory and shine as did the face of Moses when he came down from Sinai. So from there, obviously, uh, it's very clear that the living saints and the context is the last days and God is responding to his people, the people who are still alive on earth, not those who are dead, not those who have died since 1844. This doesn't include the special resurrection individuals. These are the living saints at the end of time who have never seen death ever. Mm -hmm. And they are still 144,000 true Christians alive on earth at this time. Uh, so it is, it is a literal number, that's the first section, but also, the separation between who is in the 144,000 is also given in the context here. It's those who never see death at all. Mm -hmm. Correct. Absolutely. I don't... That was obvious what it said. Uh, there's 144,000 in number. It's a literal number. And they go through the time of Jacob's trouble. They go through the time of the seven last plagues. Uh, they will never die, as Revelation 14 that we read last uh, Sabbath. They're redeemed from the earth. They're the Elijah people. Uh, they're translated. They never die. So those. So just to clarify, then, those who have been giving the message of the third angel since 1844 and on, who have died they are not included in that 144,000 literal number. That's correct. Because, again, Cody, one of the earmarks of the 144,000 
they don't die. Whereas, excuse me, I'm sorry. The 144,000 do not die. They're redeemed from the earth. Whereas those who come up just before Christ comes. Uh, we talked about this when we looked at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Right. Where it said, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to uh, everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So... Uh, in that special resurrection, at some point before Christ comes, we don't know exactly when. Uh, I don't think Ellen White specifies it. Great Controversy 637 talks about the special resurrection of those who died in the faith of the third angel's message. Uh, they die and they come up just before Christ comes to see Jesus coming. They are not a part of the 144,000. Uh, those who also come up in the special resurrection, as Daniel 12 says, as Revelation 1-7 says, uh, as Great Controversy 637 says, uh, it's those who pierced him, those who have been the most violent opposers of God's people through the ages, uh, they will come up in that special resurrection. They will then be slain by the, by the glory of Christ's coming. They will then rise again at the end of the thousand years. So those are the two groups that come up in the special resurrection. Makes perfect sense. And, and why Daniel chapter 12 clearly is talking about that special resurrection event and not something else because it mentions that there will be those who are resurrected that uh, will be condemned and there will be those who are resurrected that will that will be you know taken to heaven so there's a there's a time when that takes place the the other resurrections are are separated by a thousand years of time mm -hmm. so there's a resurrection for the just they rise up at Christ's at right before uh, at Christ's return rather as he calls them and then a thousand years later, then the judgment of the wicked will take place, which we'll go over as we get into Revelation chapter 20. So that's how we know that Daniel chapter 12 is talking about that specific special resurrection event because it mentions that they're both happen at the same time. Exactly. Um, now, what would you say, Pastor Hughes, to somebody who would say Ellen White is wrong about the 144,000 being a literal number. It's a spiritual number. Cody, when somebody says that Ellen White is wrong, my response would be, I'm sorry, you are wrong. Ellen White was not wrong. Um, did she grow in her understanding of things? Yes, of course she did. Uh, the, the threadbare argument about the open and shut door. Uh, she grew in her understanding. Her, her understanding of diet and health. She grew. She, she was raised a meat eater. But uh, after she had the health vision, there were still some years there where she continued to eat meat. However, there came a time where she said one morning, stomach, until you want to eat good old wholesome whole wheat bread, <laughs> you're not going to have anything. Not eating at all. And so, did she grow? Of course she grew. That, that's, prophets are people. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes people get the impression, Cody, that uh, they're, they're perfect. Uh, all the time, they, they never have any growth to make. Uh, no, that's not true. However, however, uh, Ellen White is clear. It's not a matter of growth. It's not a matter of misunderstanding. She knew what the 144,000 were, and she knew it was a literal number. And uh, I, I 
fear Cody when people say Ellen White was wrong because if they if they can say that she's wrong there well what happens if they come up to some pet idol of theirs whether it be you know McDonald's hamburgers or Kentucky Fried Chicken you know and they're going you know Ellen White says well we shouldn't be eating that stuff and they say oh well she was wrong well what's going on Cody you can't pick and choose and that is an extremely dangerous position to be in you can't pick and choose Cody it's like pick and choosing the Bible you, you can't you can't pick and choose on, on which day you're going to worship doesn't work that way so just to clarify the aspects of the growth in which you're talking about here in Ellen White so folks don't misinterpret to say well she grew she grew away from that or something no she never you're did. talking about things in her personal life and her understandings they actually grew and blossomed into bigger things but they started out in a smaller uh, a smaller more confined understanding not the full understanding as she would come this in this situation it's even different from that in the sense of she's she's speaking under inspiration and she's speaking of a vision that she's having about the last day she's seeing this happen so she say, so when she says she sees uh, in her vision i see the living saints 144,000 in number it's very very clear and if we, if we take it upon ourselves uh, to, to, well, I'm going to deny Ellen White here, or, or actually, rather, if you say Ellen White was wrong about something, you are, you are making a grave mistake in, in two ways. Number one, you're acknowledging, you're first off, you're acknowledging that she has a clear statement on this issue. Good because point. you're saying she's wrong. Good point. So you're acknowledging that she, there is a clear statement, this is what she is saying, but it's wrong. That's the first part. The second part is, with your knowledge of that, you are then, at that point, denying the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, who inspired her to write that truth, which you acknowledge yourself is very clear. You are rejecting that counsel. That is very, very shaky ground to be on. We have to be like Martin Luther and subject our consciences, take them captive to the Word of God and the spirit of prophecy. We've taken great measures uh, over the course of time. We have uh, some discussions on Ellen White's prophethood, but even in this, uh, this particular series, we talked about the Great Advent Movement and all the pillars of our faith that sprang up from 1844 and J.N. Loughborough's book that talks about some of the things that had happened at that time. And Mrs. White is the fulfillment of the scripture that said that God's last day people would have the spirit of prophecy and they would keep the commandments. So if we throw, if we throw that away, we establish a bad baseline because now we, we've We've spiritually made ourselves God. We're no different than the Pope. Because now we're going to pick and choose which doctrines are true and which ones are false. And who's the final arbiter of that truth? Not God. Me. It's very... It's, it's suicide, Cody. That's, that's a suicidal position to take. I'm not going to take that. Amen. Also, there's one other aspect of this discussion that people wanted us to go a little further into. In the comments section, they made reference to the great multitude. And I think there's confusion um, with some of the folks on, which we've gone over, who the 144,000 are. They are those who are still alive. That does not include uh, Mrs. White or Haskell or James White or people that will be most likely brought up in the special resurrection. Um, that does not include them. Those, these are the people that have never seen death.
But then what does that make of the great multitude? Who is the great multitude? Are they those that died before 1844? Are they those, are they those that uh, are part of apostate Protestantism only? There's a lot of people that said a lot of different things in the comments section. So can you help clarify that? And I do have a quote here that talks a little bit about it. Cody, the great, you, you have in Revelation chapter 7, you have the answer that uh, ends a question at the end of Revelation chapter 6. The end of Revelation chapter 6, uh, John says, right. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The first part of that question, who will stand when Christ comes? Well, those who will be standing will be the 144,000. And then, of course, the great multitude will be standing separate from the 144,000. Okay? Now, the great multitude represent the people through all the ages, from Abel all the way down to 1844, those who have walked with Christ on this earth. They will come up, they will be the people that uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says, uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the dead in Christ from all the ages rise up at the second coming to meet the Lord in the air. That's the great multitude. See, Cody... And they're not separated by sections. They're not grouped together and these are Adventists, these are former apostate Protestants, these no. are former Catholics, these, et cetera, the other groups. No, not at all. See, Cody, the, the problem... In Seventh-day Adventism, we want to say, well, you know, there, our church now is 22 million strong. And, and so... Uh, all 22 of those, 22 million, they're all going to the kingdom. Well, 144,000 of them, uh, they're going to be the, the ones that are redeemed from the earth. And the other, you know, 20 million, 249,000, they're going to be a part of the great multitude. Cody, excuse my English, but that's a bunch of baloney. It's a bunch of baloney. And... What, we, what we've done is we've adjusted our theology to, to comfort the 22 million plus Adventists that simply are called by that name. That's what it is. Cody, you Preaching know... Teaching smooth things, essentially. It's, it's, it's teaching smooth things. The fact of the matter is, in Christian service, I believe it's page 41... Ellen White says, there will not be one in 20 of those who profess to believe present truth will ultimately be sanctified by it and be saved. So of the 22 million plus, Ellen White's saying less than 5% of that group will be in the kingdom. Okay, now who makes up the 144,000? We mentioned that last week. It's Seventh-day Adventists and those who respond to the loud cry when the little time of trouble begins. Right, so okay? in, in a sense, they're all Adventists, right? They, they all become Seventh-day yes, Adventists. Yes, because they, they accept the, and believe the same doctrines. Exactly. And though these other ones, maybe, you know, let's call them babes in the faith, um, they, with the power of the loud cry, they are matured very, very quickly. And they come to a full understanding of the same truths that we have. So regardless of, because you weren't born in Adventist, I wasn't born in Adventist, but we would call ourselves Seventh-day Adventist today. Of course. 
Um, we, know, we know the truth. We, we, we hope and pray that we're faithful, that we can be a part of this loud cry, which I think is shortly coming upon this earth. And, but that doesn't mean that we would be grouped in a, in a different way because of, our, because of our past. Because I was Southern Baptist in the past, and you were, I believe you were Presbyterian, right? Methodist. Methodist. Yeah. Methodist, okay. So, no, it, it's the whole, the whole the, the faith, the doctrine, the pillars, the, the acceptance of the Sabbath and the sanctuary doctrine, all those things are going to be understood and accepted by those who come in. Even if they don't fully understand them, they will come into the message. And in the end, in the end, when this is all done, it's just going to be Seventh-day Adventist with, as far as doctrine is concerned. Absolutely. And any incorrect understandings that some of those that who have died in the faith, like Martin Luther and his consubstantiation and his understanding of the Sabbath, those will all be rectified after, Christ's, after the resurrection when Christ returns. They're all going to accept the truth at some point, obviously. Um, and everybody's going to be a Seventh-day Adventist, I mean, in doctrine at least, mm -hmm. in heaven. You know, Cody, we, we looked in Revelation 8 and verse 1 about under the seventh seal that there would be silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And we, we found out that a half an hour, prophetically speaking, is about a seven-day period. And we read a statement from First Testimonies, page 60, where Ellen White said that it would take the redeemed about seven days from the time they leave this earth till they actually step onto the sea of glass. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, I don't know how Jesus is going to do it, but during that seven-day seven period, I, I, in, I, I see in my mind's eye that he's going as he did with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. During that seven-day period, he's going to open the scriptures. Class has begun. Class has begun. <laughs> Absolutely. And the 144,000 and the great multitude and those in the special resurrection, the redeemed of, of all time, Jesus is going to be answering all their questions. How he's going to do it, Cody, I don't know. All I know is that he has the voice like the sound of, a, of many waters, and, and it's, it's powerful. And he's going to share truth so that there is clarity, there is unity of thought among all the brethren that are redeemed. So when they enter the sea of glass, when they touch the sea of glass, Cody, they, they're all going to have, you know, a, a basic understanding of truth and they will be in harmony I mean if you think about it uh, for God's foresight is infinite so he already knows the questions we're gonna ask he could now if he wanted to and this is just an interesting thought he could right now he could he could write down all the questions he knows you're gonna ask and answer them all in a way he knows that will get the truth will go to your heart and he can hand you a book the moment he meets you tailored to you, written in a way that you, most interesting book you've ever read, every question you ever had <laughs> about everything, yeah. answered right there. It's just amazing. You know, some of those stories that we, we hear, like the one about the Catholic catechist a few Sabbaths ago, they, they have some knowledge because of their background. Or like this, uh, this uh, colonel in the army that we read about this morning. They, they have some biblical knowledge. They, they want to know God. They want to follow him. But, but there's a few little pieces of the puzzle that are missing. But the Lord, like you said, the Lord knows the questions. He knows the pieces that are missing. He plugs them in. And it's like, I've, I've been in a room and I'm going, it's dark in here. And then all of a sudden, somebody lights a candle. Somebody then turns on a light. And, and you go, I've got it. 
It makes sense now. And it happens very quickly. And I, I think that's what we're going to see. Under the loud cry, when people in government positions, uh, in other churches, through the power of the latter rain, the lights are going to be going off. The pieces are going to be filled in and people are going to say, this, this is it. I, I see it. It's so beautiful. Yes. So. And the strategy that God has been working on different people that's still going on today. Absolutely. For their whole lives, the final pieces are going to be put into place in that, at that time. That's going to be amazing. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I had a quote here again from Maranatha. It's from November 27th. Uh, just a, about a month, a month and a half later, and it's from page 339, where she talks about the great multitude and even quotes Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Mm -hmm. It says, Now Christ again appears to the view of his enemies. So this is after the thousand years. And it says, Far above the city, upon a foundation of burnished gold, is a throne, high and lifted up. And upon the throne sits the Son of God, and around him are the subject of, subjects of his kingdom. The power and majesty of Christ no language can describe, no pen portray. The glory of the eternal Father is enshrouding his Son. The brightness of his presence fills the city of God and flows out beyond the gates, flooding the whole earth with its radiance. Nearest to the throne are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, hmm. but who plucked, who plucked his brands from the burning have followed their Savior with deep, intense devotion. Interesting the way the groups are separated by the spirit of prophecy. It's not by race or by different beliefs. It's by their experiences. Mm -hmm. So not former Adventists. It doesn't say anything like that. Mm -hmm. ne next are those who perfected Christian characters in the midst of falsehood and infidelity. Those who honored the law of God when the Christian world declared it void. And the millions of all ages... So that does away with the idea that the 144,000 is everybody. That's not the case. It says, and the millions of all ages who were martyred for their faith. And beyond is the great multitude, which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and tongues and um, people before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So there's multi-millions and millions of people we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. The vast throngs, like the sand of the sea, this is going to be an intense amount of individuals. And it's those, so when we put it all together, you have here the 144,000 who never die. You have those who are on the special resurrection on both sides of it, who are actually part of the great multitude. And these other, these other groups here mentioned are thus those who are closer to the throne. That's all. But they're all part of the great multitude mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. Revelation 7. Or, yeah, I don't mm -hmm. know why I always do that, but yeah, Revelation chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, that allows us to get started on verse 6 of Revelation chapter 14. This one, since we're just going to be going over the first angel's message here, I'll just read just the section on the first angel's message, which is just those uh, two verses there, six and seven. And then I'll hand it off to you, Pastor Hughes. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Mm -hmm. That's the first angel's message. Can you help us to understand what it's saying? Since, Cody, it's the everlasting gospel. Everlasting meaning it's always been and it will always be. So the principles that we're going to learn in these messages are messages that have been going since Adam and Eve fell. Uh, and within that first angel's message, and the fact that we see it coming, these messages coming in the context of the harvest, we know that 
this gospel message in Revelation 14 is especially adapted for the time period just before the coming of Christ. Uh, the judgment hour, which we know from our study of Daniel 7, 8, and 9, uh, this judgment hour clearly is pointing to 1844, October of 1844. So uh, that's the time frame and the context for these messages. However, the, the, the focal point of the messages themselves, uh, this message of God's good news to mankind has been going since Adam and Eve fell. And that's what that term everlasting would indicate. Uh, this isn't a, a new message, uh, but again, it is adapted to a special time. So I hope that makes sense. It does. Um, now, Revelation 14, and you know, the, the verse 6 also helps us to understand the magnitude of this final message before Christ comes. And it's to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So, you know, too often we get so narrow-minded that, you know, we've, we've got to help Adventists understand the message. Or, you know, we, we've got to help one particular group to, to have clarity. God is not so narrow-minded as that. And, and so we need to have a broad, a broader picture of God's plan. It's not just for a group of people who think they're special because God has been especially kind to them in revealing his truth to them. This message of Revelation 14 is to go to everybody. That means every church. That means every nation. That means every family. That means everybody. So the, the scope of these messages We've got to realize that our, our goal is the entire planet. It's the whole planet. And so to keep that perspective and, and to maintain the, the, the broadness of what God has called his children to do. We haven't been called to understand these messages, to sit on them. Uh, We've been we called haven't... to give them. What's that? We've been called to give them. We've been called to give them, Cody. And, you know, too often, especially in a fluent, prosperous uh, America and, and other uh, advancing nations, we get complacent. And we, we think, oh, well, I've got the message. Yeah, but getting the message puts a tremendous responsibility on every person that is given that message. To sit on it is, is terrible. It, it's, you know, it's, it's just horrible. You know, it brings something up for me on a personal level as well because I've actually thought about this uh, a couple of months ago. I was thinking about this deeply and um, you know you ask the question, you ask, you ask the question to the Lord because there are a lot of true Christians out there in other denominations. Mm -hmm. they, they, he says that. They're, they're, most, of, most of his people are in the other churches. Absolutely. And you ask the Lord the question, why, why me? Why do I know, but this other true, he's a true Christian too, or she's a true Christian too, why doesn't she know? And the answer comes back, 
because you haven't told them yet. Mm. <laughs> you know, when I ask the question to myself, why me? Why us? Why you watching this right now? Why were you and not somebody else entrusted with this truth? God doesn't want us to sit on it. Mm. He's putting it in the hands of people and the responsibility then, therefore, is, and it's a great high calling, to give that message to the world. Amen. Why was that other person not chosen and you were? Because you are the one God is calling to give the message to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Everything in these three angels' messages... Because it's not just the first message that's the everlasting gospel. It's all three of the messages. So all three of these messages should show us the frailty and the weakness of ourselves personally and the weakness of fallen, suffering humanity. And that our only hope is found outside of ourselves in the arms of a loving Savior. Amen. Each one of those messages, while they bring out, I mean, you know, we're going to see it. Each one of these phrases, to fear God, give glory to Him, the hour of His judgment, worshiping the Creator, Babylon is fallen, uh, the warning against worshiping the beast in His image, receiving His mark in His forehead or in His hand. Yes, they bring out, and we can't negate that. I've, I've heard people, you know, say, well, these messages are about us loving Jesus. Okay, yeah, they definitely are. But that does not throw out or negate the fact that there are certain things that are very clearly identified here that that you can't, you can't just push to the side. They are core issues in this end time battle, this end time great controversy over the gospel of Christ and how people will respond to it. So uh, there's, there's got to be a balance that's maintained. Right, because all three messages, as we'll see, all three messages declare or are about judgment. Absolutely. So it's not just about kumbaya and love gospel stuff. That's not what it's, it's, there's judgment, there's a warning. This is a warning. And what's so interesting and paradoxical about the whole thing, it's just so beautiful that what is going to be presented in the first angel's message is part of the everlasting gospel. So the information is not new. It's old information. It's old truth being presented. But it's so important that obviously something's been lost here. Mm -hmm. It's so important that God has selected these particular things, given in verse 7, as the highlight of the everlasting gospel message warning, last day warning to the world. So while it's interesting, it's, it's an old truth presented as a new truth, but it is an old truth. Definitely. It's a part of the everlasting gospel. We're not looking for some new, uh, some new doctrine here. We're looking for doctrines that, have, that are in Scripture that are clearly established, but they've obviously been lost sight of in the last days, and that's why they're highlighted as the warning message to the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. The first phrase in the first angel's message, fear God. Uh, what does that mean? How does that fit into the everlasting gospel? Does it, and again, every one of these phrases, they are going to abase the pride of men and exalt Jesus Christ and him only. So do we see that in this first phrase to fear God? Well. You know, a lot of people say, well, does that mean I, I should be afraid of him? I should be scared? 
because God is, is mean or he's unjust? Not at all. Uh, to fear God in this context, it would indicate a healthy, a very healthy, reverential respect. A deep respect for a person. And that's what we have with fear God. What does it mean, though? Because as we've noticed so far throughout our study of the book of Revelation, when John the Revelator wrote down what he was shown in vision, he was dependent on the Old Testament. When it came to uh, wanting to describe Jesus in the sanctuary, in the holy place, well, what did John, there was Christ among the candlesticks. Well, the candlesticks and the garments that Christ was wearing in Revelation 1, you get all that understanding when you go back and look at the sanctuary in the Old Testament. When it came to the, uh, the beasts there in Revelation 4 and 5, uh, you know, with the wings and the different faces, well, where would you go to understand those? Well, you go to Ezekiel, you go to Isaiah. Uh, when it come, came to this, the horses in Revelation chapter 6, or the trumpets in Revelation 8 and 9, well, why did John choose those symbols? And what, what did they represent? Well, he went back to the Old Testament. So, in every case, if we're going to understand the book of Revelation, we've got to go back to the Old Testament because the Old Testament will explain what the phrase or the symbol represent. Makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it's beautiful. That's logical. That's, yes. It's just beautiful. So, in Scripture, what ideas are always connected with the concept of fear God. That's what we need to find out. So, Psalms 112, verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. Psalms 112 and verse 1. So we're looking at the concept of fearing God. Right. And what do we find in the Old Testament connected with fearing God? Psalm 112, verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. Well, there's our concept that we found in Revelation 14. Fear the Lord. Okay, so how is that represented? That delighteth greatly in his commandments. So we've got a connection right there immediately in Scripture. Fearing God is equated with keeping God's commandments. Right, and it's interesting. He's talking about a man. He's saying, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. And then the characteristic trait that he highlights of this person who is blessed is that they delighteth greatly in his commandments. Absolutely. They're Absolutely. directly tied. Absolutely. And that goes back, Cody, to exactly what you were saying a few moments ago, that we have... Now, I, f I forgot exactly how you said that. Well, I said with the everlasting gospel, what you have is you have old truths or old light that's being presented in a new way because we've forgotten it in the last days. Exact, that's exactly right. And that's exactly what we see here. The commandments of God, thrown away, right. set aside, abolished. Uh, especially, of course, number four. But this idea that the commandments of God have been made of none effect, they've been thrown away, uh, nailed to the cross. And so what does God do at the end of time? He says, wait a minute. My commandments are still as important as they've always been. That's right. The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. Now, 
Let's take a look at another passage. We'll look at about two or three more. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. The Bible said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Very clear. Very, <laughs> absolutely. Fear God and what is it equated with? Keeping of his commandments. Solomon said this at about 1000 BC. We're living in 2000 AD. That's about 3000 years removed. But like you said, we're dealing with the everlasting gospel that's always been. So the message that Solomon preached is the same that John is preaching in Revelation 14. It's the same message we are preaching today. Same message. Now, let's take a look at two others, and then we'll analyze our understanding of what that means. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. The fear of the Lord, now there's fear God, fear of the Lord, is what? It is to hate evil. Pride, arrogancy, the evil way, the forward mouth, do I hate. So fearing God is connected with shunning, turning away from, rejecting evil. Now is rejecting evil and keeping God's commandments, is that the same way of saying the same thing? Yes, it's the other side of saying the same thing, because exactly uh, right. sin is transgression of the law, so therefore if you hate sin, you're automatically keeping the law, because to do one is the antithesis of the other. Absolutely. So we have the ideas, they're saying it in different ways, but the psalmist and Solomon saying the same, it's the same message. It's interesting too, if you put all three of those together, you get the full understanding, just those three verses that we looked at, you get the full understanding of what God expects. In Ecclesiastes, it says, fear the Lord and keep his commandments. So it tells you to keep them. In Psalms, it says, the blessed is the man who delighteth in his commandments. So it's, it's how you feel about the commandments too. So now you have the spiritual component involved to where not only are you keeping them and you secretly hate them and see mm -hmm. them as a burden, but you keep them and you love to keep them, which is not something we can do. We can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then this third section, it tells you how you should feel about evil. You should hate it. So you have the spiritual components plus the actual keeping of the law all there just in these three verses so it's telling you it's telling you love keeping the commandments hate to do evil but then also actually keep the commandments as well not keep the commandments but secretly love evil and wish you could do something you know wish I could commit adultery or wish I could steal or whatever I want to do but I can't because I'm I'm saving myself here uh, by going to heaven by keeping the commandments so when you put them all together, you get, the full, you get the full view. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, there's one other passage I want to look at. Okay. Uh, there it is. Job 28, 28. Now, to say we're going to look at one more, there are a host of passages. Yes, that's, it's important you mention this. Throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, that talk about fearing God. Uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, Exodus, uh, it, it's right through Scripture, it's right through Scripture. And the same idea hits you over and over and over again. 
Always connected to the commandments. Always connected to the commandments. Uh, Job 28, 28, and unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, okay, there's fearing God, that's wisdom. To depart from evil is understanding. So wisdom and understanding are the same thing. Well, fearing God and departing from evil are the same thing. So again, perfect unity again. Perfect unity. Now the, the question is, how does fearing God and keeping his commandments, how does that tie in with the fact that through the three angels' messages, the glory of man will be laid in the dust and Jesus alone will be exalted. How does that fit? Well, can we, in ourselves, can any of us keep a perfect, holy, and righteous law? Can we do that? Not on our own. Not on our own. So, in looking into the the principles of the Ten Commandments and realizing that God's commandments are here and we are here and that by ourselves it is impossible for us to attain that standard. What happens to our righteousness? It's leveled. Our pride is humbled in the dust because we recognize that there is a standard that we could never attain to by ourselves. So does the message of fearing God and honoring his commands, does that abase and humble human pride? Completely. Completely. So where do we go? Where is there hope in a message that completely destroys human pride? Well, there's hope in Jesus Christ. And it's only in him and through him that man can be forgiven for breaking that holy law and it's only through faith in Christ that man can be elevated to keep that law. So the, the two core principles that we've said runs through scripture in the abasement of human pride and the exaltation of Christ alone are clearly seen in the phrase, fear God clearly seen that's amazing because so, it's impossible it is impossible for us to do it so we that has to that part of ourselves has to be abased it has to die in order for us to even have an, a, a chance at being able to actually fulfill this command from God to fear him mm -hmm. and this idea what about that man who ran away from home? Felt completely guilty, lied to his dad, stole from his brother. He's heading, he's heading who knows where. Comes to a place, wishes he could die. And then as he falls to a, a very uh, restless sleep, he sees that, that dream and he sees that ladder and that ladder said, there's hope for you. Yeah, you've, you've missed, you've failed, you've missed the mark, but I've got a plan for you. But that plan is only going to be, come to fruition through the ladder. 
not going to come through your planning and you know your your devious ways but it's going to come as you will trust in the latter and so the everlasting gospel that God's people are called to preach in the context of the second coming it's the everlasting gospel amen it's what Jacob saw it's what the is what God sought to teach the Israelites it's what David learned through his immorality with Bathsheba it's it's the gospel message the abasement of man just as you were talking about at lunch today Moses learned in all the great schools of higher learning. And that was about the exaltation of human pride. The absolute antithesis of what God wanted for him and for all of humanity. Because God knows that through the exaltation of man, there will only be failure and destruction. And so Moses failed. He thought, I can do it. I'm going to kill this Egyptian. I've got the plan. So God had to remove him from that to be abased, for his pride to be abased. And it took 40 years for him to be brought low so that Christ would be exalted in his life. Amen. The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. Amen. Precious. So, there are other meanings. Cody, I, I know there's, a, I don't remember the exact place, but I know there's a, a statement in the Old Testament uh, where tithing is talked about as a way that people fear God. And I've looked at that and I've thought, what, what is the core principle of the tithing system that God put into place? And it's a, it's a recognition by a human being, God gave me the strength, the physical strength to do this job. And I'm simply giving back to him what he has asked. But it's an acknowledgement of our dependence upon our creator for the ability to work and make a living. It's an acknowledgement that the special gifts that we have and use, they're actually talents from God. They're not ours. They're on lease. Absolutely. And when we give tithe back, we are, we are reverentially obeying God's command to pay him what, what he sees and he has commanded is due to him, which is 10% of whatever we make. Mm -hmm. And each person has different talents. And when you come back and you receive, you receive your wages for the work that you've broken your back to do all week, you acknowledge that you would not have been able to do any of it had God not given you the strength to get through the week, the food, the water, the talents, the mental capacity, everything. Mm -hmm. All of it to accomplish that task was given to you by the Lord and you are giving him his due. You know, had a a banker, somebody asked me if I would meet them at their bank to, because they had missed paying their tithe for a few years. I said, okay. And so I met the individual at the bank. And um, there was, it was quite a substantial, it was in the thousands of dollars. And the person said to the clerk, well, write, write a check out for this amount of money. I think it was like $6,000. And uh, the clerk was taken aback. And so immediately called the president of the bank to come out to the front. 
And the first thing out of the bank president's mouth to this individual was, oh, that tithing system, that, that's been done away with. You don't, you don't do that anymore. And I looked at her and I said, ma'am, are you telling me that people are no longer dependent upon the creator for strength and for the abilities they have to do their work? Mm, yeah. She looked at me. <laughs> she, was, she was very embarrassed, uh, very embarrassed. Uh, she still encouraged the person not to give me the money. And, you know, when you look at that, what, what is that? What's the person saying? They're saying, look it, I make this money on the sweat of my brow. Right. And, and the food I eat... Uh, you know, I buy it from the store. God has nothing to do. You know, it's, it's a complete denial of the fact that there's a God. And of the reality that he's, he's responsible for the food on your table. Absolutely. For your, for your abilities. Yes, you are, putting in, you are putting in the work, perhaps, to earn the money or to increase your knowledge. You're, you, there's, there's work to be done there. But he's given you the faculties to do it. It's like, it's like a farmer uh, on, a, on a plot of land. God has given you the land. You have to farm the land. But if you didn't have the land to begin with, you couldn't farm anything. Mm -hmm. He's the one who's given you, here, this is what you can work with. Whatever type of talent it is, whether it's physical strength or or, or stronger mental capacity than some other people or whatever it is he's given you this this is your portion now improve it but you have to do the work but people think that because they're putting in work it's on them now and they've done all of it no they they didn't they they didn't supply the land that was necessary to farm only the lord did the entire tithing system, Cody, that's tied to fearing God, it abases, it humbles human pride. That's what it does. Absolutely. And I've actually done a word study here on the, on the word uh, fear God, and I found that one of the definitions of it was reverential obedience mm -hmm. and tithing and commandment keeping and hating evil, all of that fits perfectly in that understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, Pastor Hughes, we got through fear God. So that's the <laughs> first part of the <laughs> first angel's message. Uh, but next time we'll take a look at giving glory to him and this very important concept of the fact that the hour of his judgment is come, what that will mean. Then we'll look at worshiping him, how that's important, why it's important, why it's mentioned there in the last days is being highlighted specifically, and then what is meant by the, the one who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And I think it's important for folks to understand that the three angels' messages are God's last day final warnings to the world. So we understand, once we understand everything about the first angel's message, we can build upon it by learning the second angel's message. But everything pivots from the first angel's message. The first angel's message is really telling us what God expects from us. And the second and third are warnings and a final warning um, to, to not be a part of the group that rejects the first angel's message. Absolutely. Essentially. Absolutely, Cody. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you would, would you like to add anything else? I'm excited about the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Will you please close us out in prayer? Sure. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the things that you allow uh, to come into our lives that 
help us realize that we are nothing and you are everything. Yes. Thank you for uh, how patiently you, you seek to teach and, and guide us day by day to learn to not trust in ourselves, but to trust in you. Yes. And to find all the gifts and all the joys and all the blessings that you promise to give to your children. So we pray for your guidance as we continue to study these messages and to share them with as many people as we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.